may be seated. Brother Wall. Brother, welcome this morning. Pretty excited about the admissions conference. Yeah. Did you say Greece? Greece is I can do me some Greece now. <laughs> Fat back and hard downs. Mm-mm-mm. Chris, that's what I'm talking about right there, right? So. One other thing. French fries do not constitute a French dish. <laughs>
And so Naomi here, she came back and she had nothing. She lost everything she had. But it all started back in verse number one when the famine came. She was living for God, doing what she was supposed to do, until a heart got beat. And that's how some of us are. We give our tithe, we pay our tithe, we give our faith promise, until a little bit of resistance comes our way. Yeah. And we say, well, we'll just skip this time. Right? That's how sin is. We skip one time, and it's easier to skip the next time. Yeah. And the next time, and the next time. So I would encourage you not to go down that path. Because the end of that thing is just like my own. You're going to lose everything you want. So don't let that happen to you. Have you seen it?
never late. And he's never early. He's on time. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm early everywhere I go, unless I'm hindered in some way that can't be helped. But the Lord's not that way. That's right. The fullness of God's time. That means when, when everything was right and God's time, right on time, He sent forth His Son. Everything that happened in the life of Christ was right on time. And, uh, and, and if you're a believer this morning and you love the Lord, everything that's happened in your life is ordained of God right on time. And you can trust the Lord. And I want to preach on that this morning. We can trust Him. And I want to preach tonight on what it means to wait on the Lord. A uh, very familiar passage to me, anyway, Lamentation chapter 3. While you're turning there, Lamentation chapter 3. I've given an illustration that was brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago uh, about a man who was in the middle of a flood and the water began to rise and, and um, he's up at the second story of his house. Robo comes by and he said, he said you, want to, you, want to, you want to get out of the house and get the boat? He says, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on God. And uh, this is the attitude of some people, though. Um, so he kept rising and he finally got up on the, on the roof of the house <coughs> waiting for the Lord. Guy comes by in a motorboat. He said, you, know, you need to get on. The uh, water's continuing to rise. He said, it's all right, it's all right. I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. So said, okay, buddy. It's your, your funeral. He left. Now the water has risen to point he's out treading water right in the middle of his front yard. Trying to stay, trying to stay alive, trying to survive. Helicopter comes by. And somebody lowers a rope down to a ladder. And he, and he said, get on that, climb up. He said, I'm, I'm waiting on God. Never mind, I'm waiting on God. Well, he, he, yeah, he just went on and tried to beg him. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't get in the helicopter. So, um, they flew away. After a while, you run out of energy. You can't tread water anymore in the ground. Well, they went to heaven. You think somebody that stupid, they go to heaven. They know the Lord. I don't know how stupid they are. They go to heaven. He got to heaven. He said, Lord, I waited on you and you let me down. He said, no, sir. I sent you two boats in a helicopter. It's your foolishness that got you uh, drowned. So, many times we have the idea of waiting on God is not doing anything when God sends some help. But that's not waiting on the Lord at all. The Bible says in verse number 25, the Lord is good, and He is. God cannot do anything that's not good. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above. It comes from the Father of life, and there's no parents, there's shadow of dirt. Now I had some bad things happen to me in the last 31 years, but I'm going to tell you what. God is still good. That's right. That's right. That's right. Sometimes at the time, I would call them. There's some times I've had some doubts about that. But I'm going to tell you the Word of God stands. And I believe the Bible. I don't believe circumstances. I'm not believing what man tells me. I'm believing the Word of God said. The Lord is good. Who's He good to? He's good to them that wait for Him. Amen. God's good to them. You want, you, want, you want the goodness of God? Wait on Him. Wait on the Lord. You know what? That's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. That's right. Why? It's human nature trying to put your hands in, into something and make it happen. We don't want to wait. We get discouraged. We want to quit. God didn't do what he thought he was going to do. And so we just walk away. But he said the Lord is good unto them that wait on him. And then he said this. He links the two together to the soul that seeketh him. Which means you cannot wait on God if you're not seeking for God. Right. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Number one, it means that you're trusting him. Right. You believe in him. That means during a time of crisis, during a time of great need, during a time of great burdens, great heartache, you make a decision. It says, you make a decision, I will believe God. You know, the faith is, is an act of the will. It's something that you decide to do. Uh, the, the demons of hell are telling you all kinds of things. And you'll have all kinds of feelings. Yes, sir. But you put your thing, feelings aside and the faults aside. And what other people are telling you aside. And what other people believe aside. And say, I will believe God. Amen. 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 That, that's what waiting on God is. It means you are relying upon Him. You have relinquished all self-confidence. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 50. Who is among you that fears the Lord? That obey the voice of his servant and walk in darkness and have no light. That means they can't have it. They can't have it. It's in the Bible. 
that people believe God, they trust in the Lord, and yet they're in death. So they have no light. God has called to them. They don't know the direction they're supposed to take. And the Bible says here, let do what? They trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon God. That means wait on the Lord. That means you're not doing anything. That means you, you relinquish all uh, confidence in everything but Him. And verse number 11 says this, Behold, all you that came upon if you say, well, I'm not waiting on God to move myself, that's a man that kills the fire. That's a man that gets in the flesh. That's a man that walks away from God. You comfort yourself about which sparks to walk in the light of fire, and the sparks that are ever kindled, and you shall have my hand, you shall lie down in sorrow, buddy. It builds and it behooves us to wait on God. It behooves us to trust in the Lord. It behooves us to put our confidence in God Almighty and relinquish all confidence and everything else except for Him. When you go to this and when you go to college, you're going to, you're going to be tempted to believe a professor. Yeah. He's going to tell you things that are contrary to what the Bible says. I don't believe the Bible. Hey, that press is going to die. One of these days he's going to be pushing up days. One of these days the word is going to eat his flesh. Hey, his word is going to die with him. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But this book, before you let it go back, is an advice for him. And it's established. We can stand on this Bible. We learn to wait on him when we encounter things that are beyond our power. And we don't like circumstances beyond our power. What does that mean? That means that you have an accident and you land in a wheelchair. That's beyond your power. That's right. That means when you go to the doctor and he declares you've got a mass. That's beyond your power. My wife's sister now has a mass in her lungs that's been growing for a while. We do not know what that is right now. But it's beyond our power. That's right. In lamentation here in the scripture we're reading, these people are under under destruction. They had no help, nobody to turn to. The Bible says in Psalm 69 and 20, I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. I'll tell you, friends, in this world, you won't find a whole lot of people that will help you, that will take pity on you. But the nation of Israel, not one nation would lift a finger to help them. They were in devastation. And the Bible says in chapter 1 of Lamentation, verse number 12, Is it nothing to you that all of you that pass by? Behold, to see if there be any sorrow like my sorrow. But nobody helped them. Nobody would come to the rescue. But then Jeremiah writes down, listen, Hey, the Lord is good if you will. That's right. He'll come to your rescue. Listen, man, you, you, you try for others to help you, and they fail. It doesn't mean that you can't use means, by the way. And he said, if you get sick, well, I'm going to wait on the Lord, I'm not going to use medicine. That's lunacy. I mean, God give doctors wisdom, and, they, and, and medicine is, is, is good. Now, we sat, uh, when they said leukemia, and I sat and told Dr. Saha in a counseling room, I said, we're people of faith, we believe God. I said, I'm thankful for doctors and nurses and the wisdom and the medicine, and I'm, 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 I'm glad, that, but what I, ultimately what I'm putting my faith in is the Lord. Why? Because if God doesn't speak to that medicine, it's not going to do any good. If God doesn't give the doctors wisdom, it's not going to do any good. Friends, listen to me. God is the one who really overrules and overrules and overrules all the affairs of men. you got a rebel in your house. So what do you do? Just wait on God. No, sir. That's love and kindness and mercy. And, and you help them. Now, I'm not talking about the one that you just let to fire in your house. And, no, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about one that has left the house. I'm not going to adopt all the rules. So what do you do? Keep reaching out. Keep reaching out. That's good. So I'll just pray in front of the Lord and ignore him. No, 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 no. You, I believe that, that God gives us enough sense to use me. Why the prodigal son went home? Why? Right? It's because he knew he could. Right. Yeah. And a lot of prodigal sons uh, don't go home because they can't. And some don't go home because they know they're not welcome there. Yep, that's right. I know, I know a prodigal boy that went down in, in the middle of the night and down in his parents' driveway and sat and looked at the house for a long time waiting for him to go in. But could not because he would not be able to see what does it mean to wait on the Lord? It means you can't dictate the time. Yeah. I mean, we put God on the time block. God's not pushing the time block, buddy. Right. It's a way is to trust Him even if the time runs long, and that ain't easy to do, buddy. Moses waited 40 years. Joseph waited 13 years. Abraham waited 25 years. David waited 10 years in exile. Oh, God, the heaven of God gave him in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel and anointed king when he was 17 years of age. But he didn't take the throne until about 13 years later. Are you listening to me? We have a tendency to put God and live in Him to some kind of time. God will give you a week. I'm going to give you a month. I'm going to give you six months. I'll give you a year. And then when God doesn't do what we think He ought to, then we get angry and quit serving. Yeah. But God's not in a hurry. That's right. She just sang a while ago with John 11. They waited two more days. He, he, he listened. He was as far as Mary and Martha concerned four days late. 
But he's never late. He's always on time. We have to accept this by faith, friends. We don't necessarily like the circumstances we've been put in, but we have to know that God doeth all things well. We can't order the outcome. That's what it means to, 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 to wait on God. We, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. John chapter 11, Mary and Martha saw his healing. They laughed as he knew God was his sick and he did love Lazarus. You know, I wonder, I wonder if, they, if that relationship had been different. What would he have done? Think about that. But he waited and he let Lazarus die. He said, well, I wouldn't have done that. Neither would I. But I ain't God. I don't know everything like he knows. You know, we like the little boys watching the parade on the other side of the fence looking for a knot hole. All we see is what's passing before us at that moment. But God's like God sitting up at the top of the tree and he sees the beginning all the way to the end. He knows everything that's going to happen. We don't understand when, when, when it doesn't seem to be good in our favor. Look what he says in verse 25. The Lord is good and we to wait. But we waited and good didn't come. Not that we can see. What we consider good didn't come. And we asked by asking questions. What not faithful? Uh, there's something wrong with me that I asked. It was my request and I asked what I prayed for. Was it wrong? Uh, I, I, I trusted him. I wonder if the faith was strong enough. Uh, I, I labored in prayer, but was it enough? And we keep asking ourselves these questions. And if all this is true, then why, God, why, why did you not come on time? Why did you, why did you wait? Yeah. And even though he doesn't grant what we uh, ask, it doesn't mean he didn't hear us. That's right. Yeah. You, you, you understand, if you put yourself in the place of the Son of God, he said, I do always those things that please the Father. Can you not feel the burden of Christ at, when the message was sent to him to come when Lazarus was sick? He wanted to go. He desired to go. He didn't have to go. Just speak the word. That's all he had to do. He told one centurion, he said, your, your, your servant's well. And he went on. He believed the word. He didn't, he didn't have to go. But he's grown. He wants to do, but he knows he can't. Man, what a what a what a battle that must have been in the heart of the Son of God. When we were the first Baptist church, we labored and we did right. I mean, honestly, we visited and knocking on doors. They never had a visitation program in that church. Never did have one. As far as I know, we never did have one. The whole time it was just been in existence. So we started one. And then we started knocking on doors. As a matter of fact, we started the same thing we started here. We started Operation Go and we started training people in, uh, to, to win souls for Christ. They, they didn't know what that was. I, I, I'd take them out and, and knock on doors. We knocked on doors all over this, all over this uh, city, up and down the roads, knocking on doors, telling folks about the Lord. And, and at that time, people let you in. And this is a, a 1990. They would let you in the house. I'd go in and sit in my house, sit in the living room, and I'd open the Bible and, and give the gospel. They don't let you in now. <laughs> this past um, Thursday night, I had a great visit talking to a fellow by the name of Devin. And Devin, and Devin, and when I first started talking to him, he thought he was all right, pretty good. But by the time we got done, he knew he was lost on his way to hell. And, and listen, you don't find that very often. And I told Devin, I said, I'm coming back. I'm going back to his house. I'm going back to see him. We were at First Baptist Church. I mean, I was studying the Bible and praying, and we were doing everything right. And, they, and of course, they had a boat on us in, in July of, of 1990. And, of course, the, the boat on our way. And I knew that the second boat was coming. And I said, people stood for me. This is the last time, won't the next time. Because the closer Jesus got to Calvary, the less people followed him. And by the time he got there, uh, he by himself. The closer you get to Jesus, the less friends you're going to have. The less your family's going to understand. And it's going to happen. But when you when you open your mouth for Jesus, they're not going to like it. Uh, if they've been living carnal lives, they're not going to like it. They're not going to like it. The closer you get to Jesus, they don't, they don't understand it. They don't understand what's going on. If you, if you go off the deep end, you go off your rocker. Uh, and so they, the more we got, uh, went on and on and on. And we did everything right and prayed and fasted and worked and asked God to intervene and to help us. So we had another boat come up on Father's Day of 1991. And, and uh, a friend was hoping and, and we were hoping and all of us were hoping that we'd be able to uh, give it all that old corrupt crowd and keep them. Because we were, people didn't say that. I mean, that time, 100 people in the first year, I mean, things were happening. I mean, I mean like hot going, boom, boom, things were going on. Tides were coming up, tents were going up, and, and, uh, and, and what they used to call a training union, which is now, I forgot what it was. I mean, we started off with about 15 people and ended up down about 60 on Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock. I mean, the things were happening. You know, boy, and then you would look at that and say, well, surely God's going to come to our rescue, and we got voted out. Did God hear our prayer? He did. But see, we can't always dictate the outcome. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. 
You know, I'm thankful for the, for the prayers that God's answered in the way that I've asked Him to do. But there are many times I've asked for things that come to pass the way I want. That's right. One of means to wait on him to seek Him. Notice what He said in verse 125. The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him to the soul that's changed Him. He's linked those two together. You know why? It's because some people will look for what God will do for them, but not look for Him. That's right. You see, if you're really waiting on God, then you're seeking Him. You're not just seeking what he can do for you. You're seeking him. Mary and Martha were seeking him. They didn't want to seeking him to heal that. They were seeking him. We, we, they didn't say to speak the word only. They said, you come. We want you. We want you down here on the premises. But listen, I'm going to tell you, when I get in trouble, I want him. Hey, I want you on the side. Some people just want to use him. That's right. They don't want him. They want him. They want him to do for them. That's right. And when he don't do it for them, they get mad. Yep. See, when we, if we're really waiting on the Lord, we are seeking Him in the person of Christ. That's right. Amen. I preached this thing in Brother and, and Tammy's funeral, and I talked about when Isaiah uh, saw also the Lord. And you know the Bible says in the 12th chapter of the book of John, who he saw? He saw the person of Jesus Christ sitting on that throne. It's yes. over there in John chapter 12, isn't it? Yes, amen. Wow! Hey, man, he was, he was looking. Hey, the help he needed, he got in the person of the Son of God. That's right. Amen. Jesus has been sitting on the throne forever. You know that, right? Yeah. Past, present, and future. Forever. To wait is to hunger for Jesus. To thirst for Him. To desire Him. Mary and Martha saw Him. They wanted Him. And you know what? He did come. And when you wait, when you're waiting on Him, listen, uh, He'll come. Yeah. Are you waiting on the person of Christ this morning, or are you just waiting on Him to do for you? Go ahead. There is a difference. Yeah. Yes, sir. Above everything else, we need Him. Yeah. You don't want to get your life cleaned up? Him. Yes, sir. You don't want to cause you to come to Sunday school? Him. Amen. You don't want to, you don't want to cause your kids to send your kids to Sunday school? Him. I never said, well, you don't have to take them to Him. They ain't telling kids to Sunday school. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense and 
there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar and the instant. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. I don't know about you, if I was in the middle of the church sometime and I was serving the Lord and there was nobody else in there, I go on Friday night prayer meeting and we somebody's in one of the rooms back there and the lights are off, got a little dim light to walk around praying. And all of a sudden, an angel appears and you know what? I'm going to run out the door. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't waiting around for it. I know he might be with that other fellow. I don't, I don't mess with it. But the angel of the Lord said to me, if you're not, you better tell that quick because I'll be gone. I was up there praying one night and I felt the presence of the hell. The hell come on out of the fellowship hall about 2 o'clock in the morning and I was up in this building. And I said, I know who you are. Get out of here. And I, and I have, a, I have a, a, a phone. I listen to Spotify and, I, and music, Christian music while I'm praying. It's turning out really low. And all of a sudden, my, my phone went out. Boom. I said, yeah, yeah, okay. I know who you are. Go away. Leave me alone. Yeah. You ever have that kind of stuff happen to you? Yeah. 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 So he's in there praying. Look what happens. Here's another time for I for thy prayer is Wife Elizabeth shall bear this son, and that's why I call his name John. I yes. what mean. That means he's waiting on God and praying all at the same time. That's right. Now, you know, John, he prayed. And there was a time when he believed that God was answering that prayer, but he come to the point now where he didn't believe. He's still praying. Imagine that, still praying for it, didn't believe it's coming. Am I talking to myself this morning? You ever done that? You pray for things, you really don't believe they're going to pray. Yeah. Oh, God, please do it! You don't believe it. You don't believe it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, God's so merciful. Sometimes He just gives things we ask for. Yeah. Above, above it, all of me had ever asked or think. Yeah. Yeah. We, had, we had put confidence in God, but we, we're asking in it. And, and you know what? Out of His mercy and His goodness, He gives it to us. We're, we're, not, we're not trusting. We're not living for Him. And He blesses your life. Yeah, that's right. He's good to you. You know He's good to you. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting doesn't mean, as I said, being idle and doing nothing. It's like a preacher who said, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to fill up the church. and never did anything to do with him. Uh, that's not it. I mean, listen, if you're going to fill up a church, you've got to do something. you got to go out there and work. you got to go out there and labor. Sure. And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I feel like I have, I have neglected some of my church members because I've been so tied up in, 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 the, in the last weeks of all of the, 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 the problems and the heartaches and the pain and, and the sickness and the death and all the things that have been going on. Danny Floyd called me yesterday. He said, Preacher, I'm, I'm just so sick. I can't go. Listen, COVID hit him really hard. And he's, he's been weeks trying to get over this because that heart condition he's got. Pray for him. Yeah. I'm hoping yeah. he's listening to the sermon this, this, this morning. What are you getting my way? That's the second part of the sermon. What do you gain by waiting? I want you to go to Isaiah 49. This is my last one. When I write this down, people kind of amazed at what my last verse is because it's only the last part of the verse. Ezekiel uh, chapter 49. And I know it's in the Bible somewhere. I, I saw it this morning. Uh, Ezekiel chapter... No, I said Ezekiel. I mean Isaiah. Isaiah 49. See, I don't even know my last verse. Isaiah 49. And y'all almost did it. Oh, it almost been a bad mood. <clears throat> Isaiah 49, verse number 23. We don't, we don't, we don't ordain two deacons tonight. You know that. Right? Maybe no one I'm telling you. We don't ordain two deacons tonight. And, uh, and, and we could, what is that? That's a death sentence. Yeah. Because not too long after that, you'll feel like committing suicide. Just ask him. And I'm going to have, I'm going to have Jerry give a testimony about how, what it is to be a deacon tonight. Yes, sir. And you ain't going to, Randy Kirby's going to do that too. You ain't here, Randy? He's out, he's at home. I see you. Okay, he's outside. He's with George, though, right? Yeah. Y'all take turns with that, don't you? Yeah. See, George, now he don't bother me, but he might bother other people. I, as a matter of fact, the guy we're busy with, uh, Debbie, uh, he was standing there holding the door. And we were standing on the outside of the porch. And, of course, we couldn't go in the house. We wouldn't let us in the house. He was holding the door. And it's some kept pulling that door back like this. He kept pulling the door back like this. I said, my goodness, what did And there's some kid in there. I said, man, that kid needs a woman. He's a woman. That's funny. I'm like, yeah. And then he said, she said, please pardon my child's uh, got off. And I understood. Yeah. I said, hey, we got, we got our church has got that too, so you can bring them on. 
y'all, y'all listen. Hey, if that back that pistol, hey, let me, let me say this while I, while I got this on my mind. If we had babies in here, and they come in here, and they got a child that's unruly, we had this not long ago uh, at work with Tracy, and stepped down that second pew, and they got up and left the building because that kid that couldn't control the child, shut up in the building, please go down there and get that child and take it to the nursery for him so they can hear the gospel. Yeah, you're right. Amen. We are here. Isaiah 49, verse number 23. Look at the last part of the verse. The Bible says, But they shall not be ashamed. You wait for me. You know what you get by waiting? Promise fulfilled. That's right. Just last week, last Sunday morning, we waited for Milton Taylor. Now, this was not his fault. He, he went on, ignored the detour sign, and went down there and, and, and hit a dead end on Business 85. And then he got disoriented and couldn't find his way, and it took him an hour just to get here. But my point is this. We waited on Milton Taylor, and he didn't come. Yeah. If you wait on the Lord, he will come. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. He always does. If not, then his word will be a lie. That's right. What else do you find? Well, in our text, you know what you find here? Goodness. He is good unto them that wait for him. God cannot be anything but good. Right. He's good to us, and what he does is good for us. Yeah. We may not see it. As a matter of fact, we, we may not even realize that while, while, and even, even months or years afterwards. There's times when these things happen. Why would God take Tammy? I don't know why God took Tammy. I have no idea. Yeah. But I do know this. God never moves without purpose or plan. That's right. That's right. Everything without a purpose. That's right. Well, that was it. But we're fine. And God's eternal. Yeah. Right. He's better than you are. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't do that. I know you would. <clears throat> but he's looking at the final plan down the road. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand things. I don't understand things. I've wet buckets of tears over all this. I have drained physically, emotionally, and mentally, not near as much as the family. But, but sat on that woman for 27 years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 27 years. And I wept and I fasted and I prayed. We prayed all night and we begged. And right. God didn't see fit to answer our prayer the way we wanted. That's right. But I have to believe. If I don't believe that He's good, if I don't believe that we will, if we wait on the Lord, we'll see His good. If I don't believe that, but David said, I'll faint it unless I believe to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm not talking about this when we die. Yeah, we get to go to heaven. Yeah, we get to be with Tammy again. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
But if they'll, if they'll put their trust in the Lord, they'll see when the good comes. But there's a lot of folks that don't see when the good comes. That's right. It passes them by. But we can wait on the Lord and see the good. It may be a while. I got a story that I downloaded on my computer. My wife ordered this book. Um, actually, the books I French they didn't find it anywhere. She ordered, I forgot one of the book, little bookstores she ordered from. <clears throat> she ordered, one book I was looking for was a, was a, a downed pilot in, in the last war we had with uh, Afghanistan. Um, and he was captured as, right before he went over the, the, the Syrian border. And Amazon had that book, but it was $1,000. I gave her the title of it. I said, Do you imagine? She went on there and found a book for eight, about, well, maybe it was five, six, eight, I don't remember what it was, but it was cheap. And when I got the book, it was signed by the guy that wrote it. Anyway, she ordered this book for me, and it was coming. And it was, uh, it bogged down in Greenville, but it sat in Greenville for two or three days. Then it was her post office in Greenville. From Greenville. Well, anyway, when we got it, we got the wrapper, but the book was gone. And they said, we're sorry, but it's lost. I mean, I hope that didn't cause you too, many, too much inconvenience. No, it's just out of print. I've been looking for it. And, and yeah, no, no inconvenience at all. Thank you. <clears throat> and I said, close the service. But anyway, I found the, the story on the internet. And I downloaded it on my computer. And to the best of my ability, I'm going to try to tell you exactly how this happened. The, the title of the book is Anna. If you ever run across that book, you can grab it. And thanks for dying his family was from Sweden, I believe, Sweden. And a man and his wife had surrendered to the Lord, and they had, uh, now listen to me very carefully, I'm almost done, I'm just going to wrap this up. And a young couple in their church and another couple got together, and they left that country and went to the Congo. And these were, um, I think they were Pentecostal, but, you know, they were still giving the gospel of Christ. I don't believe, I don't know. I'm not Pentecostal, okay? But, but they still gave out the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they moved to the Congo. <clears throat> and they lived, they lived hard. They lived in, in dirt poor shacks and huts like everybody else was living. And they labored there for years. And the only one they won to Christ in, in that years that they were there was what they called a, a steward. A, a, about a 10-year-old boy that kept their house and... And then the man said, to me, well, that guy's really saved. And I, I don't know, man, he's too young to understand. But that, that's not true. We know Tim probably got saved when he was five years old. So I, I, that, you get saved as a child. That's what Jesus said. Some of the little children come there. That's an invitation, by the that's way. That's right. That's right. His wife gets pregnant while they're there. And the other couple that they were with said, it's too much for us. We're going. They left the Congo and went uh, to a, a easier place and they decided to stay. So his wife gets pregnant while they're there. Of course, they're alone now. And, the woman is, and, and, and she has the baby, but in the process, she dies in childbirth. The baby's healthy. The man comes to a place in his life where he says, I have had it with God. I don't know if I've ever been there or not. That's what he says. I'm done. He, he takes the baby, he leaves the Congo, takes the baby, and he goes in, into the uh, place where the mission station was toward the coast and gives his child away. So another missionary couple says, I, I, can't, I can't care for her. And sailed back to his homeland. This is early 1900s, what I'm understanding, so I read this. The baby grows, and this couple who he gave it to moves to America and raises a child. And she uh, surrenders to Christ as her Savior and turns and, and decides to go into missions. And so somewhere not too far away, they were having a missions conference. And so she goes to this missions conference, and as a missionary down, you were talk, I'm talking 12, we're, we're, we're talking 20 years later. They're at a missions conference, and this guy stands up, he's, he's a, 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 a black man from the Congo, and he's speaking English with, with the accent of the Congo, and he's talking about these people that came from Sweden that won him to Christ as a little boy, and, and how he now in turn, listen to me friends, how he then in turn 
won the whole village to Christ. And that village won another village, and that village won another village, and they established a Bible college there. And because of the witness of this couple, this woman dies, thousands of people in Africa had gotten saved, and many of them sold out to the ministry. You know what's the problem? Now this man went back, he turned into a cynic, he turned against God, and his daughter went and found him. And of course he was broken and wept and apologized to the Lord and got right with God. Twenty years. Listen, you understand this? If you, if you give up and you refuse to wait and you said, I've had it, then you're going to miss the boot. This man could have been a part of a ministry that, that reached a great multitude in the interior of Africa. But he quit too soon. It's always too soon to quit. Always. And I read the Bible and I see this. Moses kept his father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. Can you imagine this? And for 40 years he followed those bunch of rebels in the wilderness. But he got to see the glory of God. He said, now you can't see my face, but I'll tell you what I will do. Here's, here's the end. Here's the country. I'll make all my goodness pass before you. That's what you get to wait. The Lord is good yeah. under those that will wait. Travis, would you come? I've heard one preacher say this, and every time I listen to him, it seems to mention it. The last half hour is the hardest time. Believe in God for the last half hour. Stay true to him. Wait for him. He won't fail you. He's promised. Now, would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? I wonder this morning if the Holy Spirit of God has spoken in your heart. And you're so preacher, by the grace of God, he's spoken to me, and I'm going to trust him. I've made a decision to sit in this field, I'm going to trust him. Would you listen to your hand? God bless you. Thank you. Many of you got burdens you carry. Trust him.